here are the things that you are going to be look, able to look forward to today. We're going to talk about um, the user adoption of technology. We're going to get a background on adult learners, and then we're going to discuss ways that adults learn differently. So hopefully everybody here has already downloaded their copy of the adult learner theory ebook on our website. So that came inside of your invite to this. If you haven't, go ahead and get it now. It will deliver to your email within one minute. But what we're gonna do today is give you the theory, the, inter the information that you need that follows along behind that. So we're gonna give you the sort of voiceover that will help you to fill that information out. So if you've got your ebook, go ahead and get it handy because you can look forward to jotting down some ideas and some different um, specifications for your organization to help you really push that Salesforce user adoption or quite frankly, any user adoption. It can be other pieces of sales technology. It can be a process. It can be anything that you want to put into place in your professional life. Although Andrew and I have tried this at home as well. <laughs> and we have found that when you use this approach, when you get to the bottom of somebody's motivation and the other things we're going to teach you today, it will help you to get done the things that you need to when you're looking at adoption of a new sort of system. So we will reference Salesforce because that's where we live all day long. That's what we think about all of the time. But you can use this in any way that you want to. I actually got a really great email yesterday from my friend Ralph who works for IBM. And he said, Shannon, um, this ebook, I'm actually gonna use these steps to teach my father-in-law how to use his remote control on his television, which I thought was really great. So. Before we get started, Andrew is going to lead us through a poll. So we are going to do that. Yeah, it's gonna be great. So, you know, make sure um, you guys are staying until the end because we do have some really interesting information coming up about the end of summer. But we're gonna go ahead and start off with a poll. I think um, it's a really good way to kind of kick off the learning that we're gonna be doing today. So we're gonna ask, how does your team learn how to use Salesforce? So pretty straight up, straightforward question. Um, but what it's going to, you know, give us some insight as to how people learn in different ways. So we have trailhead, a guided trail mix, um, a trailhead that is self-guided, one-on-one hands-on, on-the-job um, hiring approaches, group instruction, um, in-house Salesforce trainer, and external Salesforce trainer. So we have a lot of different options here for you guys to choose from. Uh, what we'd like to see is how everyone is kind of applying learning to new technology and using Salesforce kind of as the vehicle to do that. So go ahead and fill this out and we're going to take a look at what the results are and kind of go over these little bits and pieces as we start. This is great. We find so many companies that we work with and we do work directly with organizations that are either implementing Salesforce uh, for the first time or are integrating a new application that they want to use inside of Salesforce or are just changing the way that they're using Salesforce. And we also partner with a lot of Salesforce partners who will bring us in for change management for their clients as well. And these are the most common ways that we find that teams are learning how to use Salesforce. And that can either be at a sort of um, event, which says we're gonna launch something new or we're looking at a brand new um, implementation, or it can just be we're reacting to something that Salesforce has put out, such as one of the three new releases that Salesforce puts out every year, you know, winter, spring, and summer release. And so these are the ways that we find people traditionally do it. And it looks like we've got loads of votes in. So I'm going to go yeah. ahead and end the poll. And I want to share that with everybody because I think it's always good to benchmark yourself against what other people are doing. Looks like we have a pretty clear winner here, though, Andrew. Yeah, it looks like hands-on and on-the-job training, which does not surprise me because most people um, are doing things as they go when it comes to technology adoption, when it comes to user um, cases coming in. It seems that everybody kind of flies in a way to say off the seat of their pants, where as things come in, they kind of handle the problems and create solutions as they come. Um, it's a great approach for, for getting like detailed and one-on-one you know, -on -one hands-on approaches. Um, but I see we have a lot of other answers as well. So I'm not surprised that this is number one, but it definitely gives us a good segue into the, into the rest of what, um, the topics that we're going to discuss today. 
That's great. So thanks everybody for sharing how you are teaching or how your team is learning how to use Salesforce. I think it, that continues to change. You know, I remember before Trailhead was launched and it was so different then. <laughs> Trailhead is such a marvelous, marvelous thing that we have at our disposal to help our users really learn these things. So it's important for us to point out before we get started that really training isn't the only component of change management. So there, we're going to show you a couple of different things today and training is not the only way to make sure that you get your change management across so that you can get true user adoption. So those of you who are not new to our webinars, we like to give you a lot of theory and then give you a way to put that theory into practice um, so that you can be thoughtful and proactive. You know, in Salesforce, a lot of times we talk about leading indicators and lagging indicators. So what is the activity that we're going to do and then what are the results? And I would tell you that I think this is exactly the same. So the theory is your sort of leading indicator for success and then whether or not you attain adoption in terms of the things that you want to happen in Salesforce, that is your lagging indicator. So you've heard these before, if you've joined us before, if not, it is a great time for me to tell you about it. So we've got three primary theories that drive user adoption. And this comes out of our many years of work on Salesforce in the Salesforce ecosystem. Um, I'm on my 12th year now, which is amazing and exciting. And some of it also comes out of my PhD research. So I am wrapping up my dissertation. Yes. <laughs> which is focused on Salesforce user adoption. And these three theory approaches are the ones that, that really have been led to understand where user adoption happens for Salesforce. When, when companies are polled and when we get into companies, we find user adoption is typically the number one struggle and it's a really challenging one to complete, right? So you can run adoption dashboards, but guess what? They might be based on logins or true logins. Salespeople are some of the most clever people on the planet. So if they think that you're just measuring them how many times they log in, they're gonna log in, log out, log in, log out, log in, log out. And you're saying, wow, they have really great adoption. Well, guess what? Adoption is not based on just that quantitative number. So it's important for us to kind of lay the groundwork with this theory. And then we're gonna really dive into adult learning theory today so that we can give you some takeaways so that you can take that adult learner theory guidebook and fill it in and have a plan for anything that you want to implement. It's great that you have it electronically because you can now replicate it and do it every time you've got something that you want to launch. So as a quick overview, change management theory is the way that you approach change in an organization. So how can you get into an organization and say, okay, something exists right now. This is the way we do something right now. And then we have a future state that we want to get to, and there have to be steps in between there. These steps cannot be cut. They can't be truncated. They cannot be shortcut. They can't be cut out or else the organization is never going to get to where they need to in terms of the change. So change isn't something that mysteriously happens inside of an organization. It has to be thought about and has to be planned for. So there's a few different change management theories that we've discussed on our webinars before that we will share with anybody who does not, um, who has not sat in on one of those that will help you to understand how training and a communication plan and an overarching um, outcome in your final phase all work together. The next one is the diffusion of innovations theory. So this is um, really beautifully represented in an easy to read book called Crossing the Chasm, where they talk about, and it's a traditional bell-shaped curve, you have early adopters and innovators, and those are almost always the people that we're working with. Those are the people that are on this call right now today. You're the ones that say something's new, I wanna try it, I'm interested in it. I wanna see how I can break it. I wanna see how I can use it. I wanna see how it's gonna make my life better. So that diffusion of innovations theory says, how can you take the groundswell of activity you can get from early adopters and innovators and then push that into a place where the rest of the organization will follow along. So your majority and then your laggards, those ones who, and you know these people, they're in the organization and you're like, there's no way Gerald is ever going to use technology, right? He still uses a green ledger book. He's not going to open Salesforce. Well, <laughs> that is 
one of the things that you need to think about when you're looking at change management and then how to get that innovation diffused among the organization. But what we're going to give you today is a really deep dive on adult learning theory and how you can take that theory and put it into practice for your organization, for your approach, for your new project, whatever it is that you're trying to get to. So that is what we are going to discuss on this webinar today. I will tell you if you've got any questions, enter them into the um, chat box or the Q&A box at any time. Andrew's going to be monitoring them so that we can answer them at the end and they can be theory based. So how do you do this piece, Shannon? What do you mean about this? Give us a little more information or they can be practice based. Right now, I am focused on Gerald in the finance organization who needs to use Salesforce to do his FP&A planning for 2021, but he refuses to log into it. So hit us with those all throughout and we will capture them and we will talk about them at the end. We also have something really exciting to tell you at the end about Salesforce Industry Week, which is coming up in September. So hang on until the end and we will give you all the answers to your questions that we can fit in and all of the information we can give you about industry week. So when you're thinking about user adoption for any technology, which as I told you has to be both quantitatively and qualitatively measured, right? So quantitative is, is the number. That's your report that says the user adoption report, <laughs> which is how many times have they logged in? Are they using all the things that you want them to use? Are the fields being entered? Those sorts of things, but also qualitative. So do I see once we've launched this technology, we have an increase in attitudes, in results, those sorts of things. So when you're planning for user adoption, which is such a giant challenge in any tech ecosystem, these are the three things I really want you to consider. Who's going to adopt it? So who do you need to focus on with the adult learner information we're going to give you today? How will they adopt it? So that's how that innovation is going to be diffused, like I talked to you about, the majority. And then change management. So what steps are going to ensure that that technology is going to be adopted? Again, this can work for any technology, but we really think about Salesforce all of the time. <laughs> so let's get into it. We're going to give you a little background on adult learning. So there are two sort of concepts for learning that are really common to people. One is pedagogy. And you know what that PED um, etymology is. It's the same as in pediatrics, right? So that's children, how children learn. Children learn in a very rote and directed way. Sit down, we're gonna teach you how to do multiplication. Here's what's gonna happen next. You need to learn all of these things, dear child, because that is what you're expected to do. Andragogy, however, is how adults learn. And guess what? Adults are different animals all together. Adults aren't gonna just sit down and learn because you told them to. And you all know this because you're adults right? <laughs> so if you sit down and the subject isn't interesting to you, the subject isn't something that's going to make a difference in your personal or professional life, the subject isn't something that you see any value in, you automatically put your walls up. You tune out, you aren't listening. These are the webinars that you jump onto and put them in the background and let them run in your ears because you're like, I might be interested in this, I don't wanna miss out on it, but it's not got 100% of my attention. So as you're planning to teach or instruct anything to adults, specifically when you're trying to get adoption of technology, you gotta keep that in mind. Not only does andragogy in theory say, adults need to have multiple things considered that are really different than children, we also see that adults are really consumed by how they're being shaped by media. So people are now having smaller attention spans where, you know, you might have been able to deliver a four hour training on somebody's first day. You now have got to break it up. Um, people like gamification. They want to earn things because they've learned things. They want to be able to say, why? Why should I be paying attention to you? You know, come out here and wrestle for my attention. And that's what you've got to do. So here are the considerations that I really want to give you in terms of 
the background on adult learning is adults want to be self-directed and they want to self-select into learning. So think about the last time you wanted to figure something out on YouTube, right? Andrew and I were riffing before this started and some of our friends were already on and we were talking about how so many people have picked up baking during the pandemic, right? A year ago, if you would have said, you know, 50% of your friends are going to be baking sourdough bread, I would have said, you're out of your mind. But <laughs> adults are now like, hey, how can I fill my time? Sourdough seems like a really great way to do it. It takes lots of time. It's hard. If I do it, there's a really nice reward at the end. And let's be honest, bread is delicious. So those adults are selecting themselves into this learning. They're going to YouTube, they're picking up cookbooks, they're asking their friends, they're trying to figure out how to cook so sourdough because they're interested in it. It's something that they think will pay off in dividends. So you've got to think about that as you're designing learning for adults. What's going to make them say, yeah, you know what? I'm into that. I'm going to do that. I'll watch the video. I'll take the notes and then I'm going to try it myself. There's also transformative learning where you take an idea that somebody already had and you turn it on its head. So this is Gerald in finance, right? This is the guy who's like, no, 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 that's not the way I do the thing. So you have to think about how you can help them with that transformation. So you can say, you know what, Gerald, though, remember, you know, in 2016, where we had that little incident where two numbers were transposed and before you knew it, none of anything tied out when we were doing the quarter end. Let's talk about Salesforce. <laughs> You're gonna think about also the experience that adults bring to the table, right? And this is something that if you're working in an organization where you've got four different generations at work, if you're working at a place where you've got some people who are used to sitting down in the office and some are out in the field all day, the experience that your learners are bringing to the table are really going to influence the way that you deliver that training to them to help drive that adoption, right? So if you're moving from another CRM system to Salesforce, or if you're adding Service Cloud onto Sales Cloud, if you bring everybody into the room at once and say the executive team and the customer service team and the people that we've got out in the field fixing the things are all gonna learn the same thing at the same time, guess what? That won't work. It will not work because their experience level is different. The, what they bring to the table is different. Your executives, they're in front of a computer all day long. So you're gonna be able to relate what they're doing to something they already know. Where the people who are out in the field, maybe you're launching field service lightning, that is a totally different training. So you have to consider the experience that your learners are bringing to the table to help drive adoption. Because guess what? This is really similar to dating, right? Have you ever gone on a first date with somebody and after that date, you say, oh, never again. That is not going to happen. If they come back and say, I know that first date was really terrible and I didn't bring my best self to the table and I treated you like everybody else that I've ever gone on a first date with and I want to have a second chance, you're not going to do it, right? You're already done with that. You're turned off. Guess what? That's how your users are with your training too. So you can't say, I know I didn't do it right the first time, but we're gonna come back and we're gonna try it again because your trust level has totally dropped. So you have to think about these things whenever you're trying to put together this type of experience for your learners to say, I'm going to address you know, all of the things that are important to you so that we can get that across right away and start ramping adoption from the very first minute that you hear me mutter the word Salesforce. And then the last thing is motivation. So this is why I said at the beginning, you can't just have a training plan. You also have to have a communication plan. So one of the things that you want to do is start to get them amped up, like salivating. They can't wait to use it. They love it so much. So when you're talking to somebody who is in a sales role and you say, hey, look, I know you already think that we're going to use Salesforce as a way to big brother you and we're going to track every single thing that you do and you're going to be worried about that sort of thing. But guess what? We have seen other people in our same industry, your peers, your competitors, the ones who are out there trying to win the same business as you see a 20% uptick in opportunity closure rates in their favor. Well, guess what? What single person who is in sales isn't going to say, yeah, that's attractive to me. I want to close 20% more opportunities to my favor. 
because they do. So you got to figure out what their motivation is, right? And that salesperson's motivation is going to be really different than that executive's motivation. And it's going to be really different than Gerald and finances motivation. So take those things into consideration. And what you're going to find is a way that you can take all of these things and put them out into your approach. So this slide is one that we love, that we talk about all the time. When we're sitting down trying to identify an entire change management approach for an organization, we look at all of these components and say, let's make sure we have the boxes ticked. Now, does it have to be hard? No. Does it have to be detailed? No. Does it have to take 17 years? It really does not. This can be informal, it can be formal, it can be something you capture in all sorts of ways. And this really uh, detailed slide is one that you may have seen before because we just wanna get your creative juices flowing. We really want you to be thinking about how this can work for you at your organization. So how can you look at these types of things and say, all right, we're gonna plan for this, we're gonna make sure this is gonna happen. Okay, so let's dig into this. We've already talked about how adults learn differently, and a lot of that is driven by their motivation, right? So we have these sort of five components that are listed up here that you have definitely seen in this adult learner ebook that you have in your email. And we're going to dig into them today so that you can get a little bit more voiceover so that when you're sitting down and filling out those lines, you know what to put in there. Okay, so we're going to run through these five. We're going to talk about some of the solutions that you can apply when you're trying to figure out how to teach these adults so that you can say, you know what, I think we've achieved better user adoption than we had before. Now, if you think, just raise your hand if you think you can say, I have climbed the user adoption mountain, I've reached the pinnacle, it's time for me to go ahead and get my trophy because I did it and I am all done and it's time for me to move on to something else. I'm watching and I don't see any hands raised and that is such a good thing because you're never done. <laughs> User adoption is continuous, especially when you're working on something like Salesforce that has three new releases a year. And that's if you don't decide to add anything else to it. So if you don't put on top of it some sort of application or a new custom object. So if you don't make any changes to Salesforce at least three times a year, you're going to be faced with a way to say, how do I get my users to adopt the new things? Okay. So you're never finished there. So this is something you need to focus on all of the time. So let us run through it. And this won't be the last time that you do. All right. So the first thing is self-concept. So when you're thinking about your users, you want to think about what their concept is of themselves and of the thing you're trying to teach them, which here's Salesforce. So this question we talk about all of the time, and it is such a great thing to consider whenever you are addressing any number of people from one to 1 million people. What's in it for me? What's in it for me? So everybody's going to say, what's in this for me? If you sit me down and say, watch this HR training against uh, you know, a particular policy, I'm going to say, well, that's something I would never do. I would never come to work with a shirt that has a swear word written on it. I just would not do that. So I'm tuning out of that training, right? As soon as I hear what that training's about, I say, okay, well, this just does not appeal to me because it does not describe me. And every single adult that you try to tell something, whether it's an informal, if you're doing Salesforce administration by walking around and you're looking at the way they're doing something, or if it's a giant formal training push, like you're moving the whole organization from classic into what was formerly known as the lightning experience and now is just called Salesforce. So if it is small or if it is big, informal or formal, you still have to consider what's in it for me. What's in it for me? And here's where you want to use your nice therapeutic you uh, language that will help people to understand you are going to get this benefit. You salesperson are now going to see a greater level of productivity, which will allow you to please more customers at once. You, dear executive, are going to have access to data that will allow you to make decisions about our go-to-market plan or how we're going to continue to service our customers or what new products or services we need to be offering. So you want to address that what's in it for me whenever you're looking at your particular adult uh, learners so that you can get them to really start using what it is you want them to do. 
a next is self-direction. So a lot of you said we give trailhead modules and Salesforce likes to call them trailhead modules, not trailheads. We give trailhead modules in a formal or informal way. And so people get to work through Salesforce that way. Awesome. For the self-directed learners, they're going to love that. Some people will need more direction than others. Some have a natural curiosity. Your innovators and your early adopters, by the time you say, here's a trail mix that I've curated for you, they're like, guess what? I'm at ranger status, what? So think about that. Think about how people will direct themselves. And then you really need to consider the culture of your company and the culture of your industry. Sometimes those two things are tied together. So we've worked with companies that are in manufacturing who have moved to Salesforce from a literal pen and paper model. We have seen people in technology who say, yes, one of the things that Salesforce does, we already have developed a proprietary application that does that sort of thing. So you wanna look to say, where is our company? How does our company learn? What is the self-concept in our company? Do we consider ourselves to be slow, steady, thoughtful, or do we like to try and break things? So look at that sort of culture to say, here's how we're gonna launch this sort of training so that these adults that we're trying to lead along can sort of understand where it is we're trying to go. So whenever you're looking at um, these types of things, I really want you to consider when you're filling out this little piece of paper, their lived experiences, so where they're coming from, where they've come from before in general. If you have a recruiting pool that you go after, if you say, hmm, we usually go after people who were in this industry. Think about their lived experiences. Think about their generational experiences. You know, are you looking at somebody who is a millennial or a Gen Z who were bred on technology? It may be so much easier for them than somebody who was introduced to technology while they were already in the workforce. And then you wanna look at technology familiarity. So have they come from another place using Salesforce? Have they been using Salesforce Sales Cloud and now you're launching Marketing Cloud? So think about what their familiarity is. And so as you're filling out this, um, this guidebook that we've sent to you, think about those sorts of things as you're taking your notes to say, you know, what is it that's going into this piece of it so that I can make sure that I address it so that we get that covered. So next we want to talk about their readiness to learn. And this one can be a real challenge, right? How many people have ever said, you know what? I have so much time in my job. I've got loads and loads of time. I wish I had more things to do. Raise your hand if you say that. Yeah, I didn't think so. I didn't think so. A lot of people... <laughs> are saying, how can I fit this in, right? I don't have time for your training. I don't have time to come and listen to what you're doing. I have a day job, okay? And I know how to do it. I have muscle memory for it. I know how to fill the thing out. I'm already there. I don't want to do that. I'm just not ready for it. I probably never will be ready for it because after this, we have an audit coming up where we have people coming in that want to see all of our books. And after that, we're going to also be launching an ERP system. And guess what? That is really a challenge, okay? So when you're looking at how people are ready to learn, some of the things that you consider here is, you know, what, what types of professional development goals do they have? So here again, you're going to dig back into your company to say, how does our company look at professional development? I work with a company right now who gives every single person in their organization a stipend for professional development and they get to decide how they want to spend it, which I think is amazing. There are other organizations that say, hey, look, we don't have time for professional development. You do that on your own. You go check the books out of the library and you pick them up and you read them. So look at your corporate culture to say, you know, how is somebody ready to learn and how is the professional development there led? Also, what are their social groups? Because guess what? If you've got somebody who's in that early adopter and innovator category, um, let's take a sales engineer group, for example. Sales engineers generally are the ones who really enjoy this technology and they want to see how they can break it. So if you've got a social group who can influence other people to say, hey, you should get ready to learn here. Here's what you should do. Here's why this is going to be great. They're going to help to spread that word for you so you won't have to do it by yourself. So that is something you want to look at so you can really exploit it. So when you're filling out this guidebook, think about those social groups. Who are the people that are sort of around them who can help to influence them to really learn it and learn it right the first time so that they can take it from there. 
And then last, what are their goals? What are their goals? And I mean their long-term goals, and I also mean their short-term goals. So if it is a salesperson, I assume their goal is always to meet their quota, right? Because salespeople live in this 90-day year concept, which is, what have you done for me lately? Don't care if you had the best quarter one in the history of the whole entire company. If you don't meet quarter two, you're going to have some real hurting coming on quarter three because you've got some catch up to do. So what are the goals that they have? It may be a little bit more nebulous or a little bit more challenging for somebody who is um, looking at qualitative goals. So, you know, I want to be the best, you know, blank I can be. So help to understand what their goals are and then let them know how what you're launching is going to influence those goals. And that's really going to help them to say, you know what? Yeah, I'm ready for this. I'm ready to learn about this. This is going to be really, really great for me. So as you're filling this page out, think about those three things and how you can use that to shape that what's in it for me of every person that that you're instructing so that you can get them to adopt this new technology. The next one is orientation to learning. And this one really goes along with, you remember a few minutes ago, I told you the difference between pedagogy and andragogy. And so generally, the way that adults like to be oriented to learning is to think about what is the problem we're solving, okay? So they want to say, why? Why are you bringing this in? Why are you making me change the way that I've been doing my job for the last 12 years? What are you doing this for? So what's the problem that we're trying to solve here? And that is one of the things that you want to be able to immediately say. So you'll say, you know what we found? We found last year that there were 12 opportunities we totally missed. We started working on them. The marketing team spent you know, $14,000 on them. They did all that they could. They brought this lead in. We converted it into an opportunity and it got, it got dropped. 12 of them got dropped just because we weren't using a CRM system. There was no way for me to run a report that said, show me all accounts or opportunities without activity in the last 30 days. Or let's look at everything that has a probability above 50% in our Monday morning pipeline. Those are big problems that can be solved by a CRM system. So when you say, hey, look, we're gonna be using Salesforce to make sure that we're delighting all of our customers and prospects in the best way, in the way that makes sense and keeps our credibility out there in the market, there you go. So you've offered to them how the training that you're gonna give them will help solve a problem that they currently have. The next one is you really wanna look for quick wins, not a big bang. So think about the first week you had at the job that you're at right now or the last job that you worked at. In your first week, you probably started on day one and filled out a lot of paperwork and did a lot of HR things and handed somebody your driver's license and had them write down the expiration date. And then after that, they said, open your mouth, friend, because we have here a fire hose and you're going to drink through it. Ha ha ha. <laughs> and then after the first week at that job, you're like, I don't remember anything that I've learned, right? They told me all of the things and I met all of the people and I don't remember any of their names and I can't even remember what it is I'm supposed to do to turn in an expense report, let alone how to do my job. Oh, that's what happens when we say, you're going to learn all the things at once. We're going to teach them to you. And after those two weeks, we're all done with you. You better do a really great job or else we'll see you at your annual review and we'll decide if you get to stay here or not. Wow, that's overwhelming. That is really, really petrifying. Imagine if you said to a person, we're going to give you some training as you need it. Now, that's harder on your trainer. I don't care if you have an entire team of instructional designers. I don't care if you have one peer led training person. It's harder to say, we're going to teach you the things you need to know as you need to know them. However, the academic theory supports it. So if you can say, I'm going to teach you how to convert a lead, and then I'm going to teach you when it's time, how to enter an opportunity, because what salesperson has an opportunity on their first day? One that you should send my way because I don't think they exist, right? They may come with a few from their previous employer, but the chances are really good. They need to learn it in chunks. So think about how you can sort of thematically spread it out to say, I'm going to give you a little bit of training now. And then when it's time, I'm going to give you a little bit more training. What you're doing there is one, ensuring your training is going to sink in because adult humans 
have about a 10% retention rate. So when you hang up from this webinar, if you are sitting here right now with your guidebook and taking notes, chances are better that you're gonna retain some of it. But if you hang up this webinar and run to your kitchen and grab some lunch and then come back and check 20 emails and then at 6 p.m. today say, okay, I'm gonna think about this guidebook now, you'll have lost 80 to 90% of what we've talked about because adults need to be able to sink, let that sink in. A training has to sink in. They have to think about it as how does this piece solve my problem? How does learning how to send a case to somebody else solve a problem that I have? Well, if you teach it to them in ways that are quick wins, it's gonna sink in better and it has an added effect of giving you trust. So you get to earn their trust whenever you run with quick wins and you have to tell them about it too. Remember last week we talked about how to enter a lead. You did great. You entered 15 leads. That's awesome. Today we're going to talk about how to enter opportunities, how to attach files, how to use chatter. So if you drag it along with them as they need to know it, they are going to trust you more. They're going to believe that you're showing them what they need to know when they need to know it, which is really awesome. And the last is role specifics. So remember in the beginning, we talked about how you should not bring in everybody in the organization at once, the executives, the salespeople, the finance people all at once to say, here's how to use the thing. That's because everybody's got different what's in it for me notifications in their brains, but also they have different specifics for their roles. So guess what? If you bring in a salesperson who does not work in marketing and will never ever run a campaign and you say, hey, here's how you run a campaign. Here's how you connect Pardot to Sales Cloud. They don't care. So they're gonna tune out, right? They need to know how does this affect me? So if I need to know how to accept a lead once somebody in marketing has converted it from Pardot, awesome. But if you're gonna go in and show them all the technical things that are inside of there, they're gonna stop paying attention and you're not gonna get the adoption that you need because you haven't specified it to their role. So does this sound heavy if you don't have a team of instructional designers? Maybe a little bit, but the way that I like to do it is just outline it and say, here are the things that they need to learn and here are the people that need to learn the things. So as you're looking at those quick win sort of trainings, you can say, all right, I understand that looking at reports and dashboards is going to be important to everybody. I'm going to give everybody that module. However, understanding how to uh, create a report is only specific to a certain number of people. So I'm only going to invite them to that training. So that's what I mean by rule specific. So think about, you know, how can you attach the what's in it for me to who actually needs what it is that I'm going to be teaching them. So then we've got the motivation to learn. So we've talked about this and you know the people who are really motivated to learn. They're curious, they ask a lot of questions, they have a lot of um, intellectual uh, abrasiveness in terms of like they just wanna know a little bit more. You know who those people are, right? Well, one of the ways you can sort of start to understand somebody's motivation to learn is to look at these specific components. So, you know, do they have a growth mindset? And let me be really clear. Nobody has a totally growth oriented or a totally fixed oriented mindset all of the time. You just don't. Sometimes it makes sense for you to use a fixed mindset, right? So driving, for example, you aren't going to suddenly be like, <laughs> wonder what happens if I move from 10 and two all the way down to, you know, eight and four. Mm. If you've been driving for quite some time, you better keep driving the way that you know how to drive, right? So having a fixed mindset makes sense there. Um, having a growth mindset is really important whenever you're looking at your job and the technology that you use there. So start to understand what is somebody's capacity for growth mindset. A book that I really, really love is Carol Dweck's Mindset, which has a few checklists in it that can help you to understand how you can evaluate somebody's mindset and also how you can influence their mindset, which I really, really love. Uh, you also want to look at their engagement. So how engaged are they in learning? So if you are running a training like this, have them type something in, have them do a poll at the beginning, have them turn their video on and literally raise their hand, not just the little hand you can raise on Zoom. 
And then you can say, okay, I can see they're engaged. Give them an assignment afterwards. If you're giving them a trailhead module, it's great because you've got the checks and balances right there, either in the quiz or in the playground where you can see they got it. They know exactly what to do. Um, and you can keep checking that engagement later. So you can come back in a quarter and say, okay, this week, I want everybody to show me how you attach a file to an opportunity. Have them show you. And then you can see, are they doing it? Are they retaining what I've learned them? And then don't forget about their bias and their lens. And so this goes back to what we were talking about before, about the culture of your organization and your industry that will give them some sort of bias. And then the lens that they bring, which is their lived experience. So, you know, are they somebody who's really motivated by technology? Are they still carrying a flip phone? Some people do. So whatever they're bringing is how you have to be responsive to best get inside of their head to say, all right, dear adult, I'm going to teach you the thing and you're going to use it to uh, adopt Salesforce a little bit better or the way that I or the company really want you to. So um, as you look at this guidebook, you know, and you're filling these things out, think about how you can make plans that will allow you to really get inside of their brain so that you can give them what they need the most, because that's what this comes down to. So a lot of us, especially, I would say 100% of the people on this webinar, I know some of you, I don't know all of you, but I can guarantee you're here because you really like Salesforce, okay? We all do. Who really likes Salesforce? You know, raise your hand, click the little hand raise and it's going to be so many more than before when i said raise your hand if you believe where nobody did you're here because you love salesforce not everybody does right we find that there will be loads of people inside of organizations even organizations that use salesforce very well that will say i don't like it it's burdensome it's cumbersome it's hard i don't understand it it comes with its own language i'm not there and i don't think i'm ever going to get there because it seems too hard well, you can change that. You, every single person on here, you're now empowered to say, I'm going to help you change what feels too hard. So use this guidebook in a way to plan those things out. And you know what, for fun, use it on the people in your house too, if you want to. You know, now that we've been locked at home since March 13th, not that I'm counting, but we're going to change the way that we do the dishes around here. Okay, we're not going to put the bowls stacked up in the top shelf. We're going to put them in the bottom shelf because I think it'll be more efficient. And we can save water that way. And conservation is important to me now. So think about those sorts of things and how you can approach those things in a way that is humorous and probably personal to you. And then how you can apply that to the people that you're trying to influence, especially now that so many people are homebound. It's way harder for us to walk around and say, you know, just give me your off the cuff opinion. Things feel so much more formal when we're separated by a screen or when somebody's typing something out that you presumably could use against them later. So keep these considerations in mind as you're saying, all right, we're trying to figure it out. Like we want to see where you're going and we want to influence that so that you can use Salesforce more and better. And you know, I love that point of like a new set of problems coming around because of COVID. I mean, pretty evident in the beginning of this call, my dog immediately has been sleeping on the couch all day, starts barking as soon as the webinar starts. We have a whole new set of circumstances and problems that are coming into the workforce. And change management and training are going to be so key to bringing people up to speed on all the very important new pieces of technology that are gonna allow business to re retain and become successful through this like newly navigated territory. So this theory is all going to be very, very important because it needs to be in practice so that as that new technology in ways that we can like really gain some headway and, and be on the advantage of COVID, um, are, it's going to be important to teach people how to use it. So great points, Shannon, really exciting stuff. Um, and I'm glad that everyone here seems to be engaged and is ready and willing to start taking these pieces of learning out into the world. So try them on your family, like Shannon said, try them on other people see how they work in, in your workplace, which is now your computer. So we do have some questions. If you guys have more questions, please go ahead and type them in, give us some stuff to talk about. But right now we do have a first question from Jessica. So thank you so much for giving us one. Uh, I'm glad you found the dating part relatable. Uh, it was definitely relatable for me as well. Um, but you say that you're a perfectionist and a young admin, which is very relatable to a lot of people here still learning and trying to get some trainings out to everyone. So 
Um, you want to keep improving at a fast pace, um, but you want to make sure that the desire for training to be perfect is also present that the training is um, effective. So you're not like rushing things. We, we totally understand this is a great question. Um, I'm sure Shannon has some amazing tips for you. So uh, Shannon, could you please um, go ahead and answer that one? Yes, definitely. Okay, so I love this question so much because it is something a lot of us struggle with, especially if we are good at and like technology and um, also have an operationally focused mind. So a lot of times we're thinking about the training that we put out as a product. So we want to run that through like the product management or the product development life cycle, and we want to hit every single point in that checkbox, right? Well, I'm just going to tell you, it is okay for you to write this down, you know, put it uh, right at the top of your laptop, get it made into a vinyl cut sticker that you put on your hydro flask, whatever it is you're going to do, but do not let perfection be the enemy of progress. Don't do it, right? Just don't do it. Because if you do that, if you say, I don't know that this training is exactly right and you never release it, you're definitely not in a better place. And if you put out a training that is 60% good, where people can get 60% better information than they had before, which might've been zero. So the way that I would love for you to frame that is just say to the first group that you train, hey guys, this is new training. It's a brand new topic for me. I want you to pay attention and I want you to give me really good feedback at the end on what I could improve. So you put it out there and let them know, this isn't perfect and that's okay. You're my first group. I'm relying on you to be the beta testers. This is my MVP. This is my minimally, minimally viable product of training. And I want you to tell me what worked for you and what didn't work for you. And again, that can be informal. Give me a little feedback in the six minutes at the end of the training, or it can be a little more female, for, formal with a survey or something. So, you know, put that out there and say, there's some warts on this training. I'm gonna stumble over some of these words. <laughs> But I want you to get this information because I know that as soon as you do, you're going to be better at your job. Yeah, and I also think that it is, you know, I do want to say that as you look at some of the trainings that are um, present on here, as you look at some of the suggestions, that fluidity will allow you to not be perfect, will allow you to make some mistakes and kind of, you know, get over them and, and go over those humps that might be present. Uh, so thank you so much for a great question and, and a good question that leads us to more topics. So now we have another one from... Greg, um, so hi Greg, thanks for coming. Uh, so we've all seen this before. What's the advice on dealing with the top sales rep, so the top dog who resists change for all reasons you've mentioned, but is also poisoning others on the team. This is a very common thing in sales teams. So Shannon, what's your advice on solving that? Yes, okay, so I will tell you, Greg, that every single person on here right now they know their person. <laughs> Every company has this guy who's like, and I say guy colloquially, who's like, yeah, I'm the no number one. I always meet my quota. What are they going to do if I don't use Salesforce or, you know, who cares if I enter all this information into this system? Uh, so I think that takes a two pronged approach. You know, one, you have to make sure that you do not overwhelm this person so much that they completely resist it and never come back to it. So, um, a lot of times these people who are high achievers, if you read that uh, mindset book, people who are high achievers, they are a little more afraid to fail, right? Because they're used to being successful. They know that their whole entire um, charisma, their character, their whole entire personality is built around them being great at what they do. So what actually could be the challenge here is they're like, I'm afraid now that if I enter things, people are going to find out that I don't always collect who else is in the decision-making process, or I don't always know who I'm competing against, so I can't give them the information they want if we get a closed lost opportunity. So there's a little bit of psychology in there where you're saying, you know, this person's just digging their heels in and they don't want to do it. And they're going to be, you know, coming forehead to forehead with me. And we're going to be, you know, in a gladiator battle because they don't want to use the system. But the reality may be they're afraid to try it and not do it right. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of times a really good way to get up against that number one performer is to just sort of give them a call, a one-on-one -on -one, and say, hey, off the record, what do you think your biggest challenge is going to be with, with Salesforce? What, why, don't, why don't you want to use it? 
you know, tell me, just tell me because I'm here to help you. You know, I literally exist to help you. And I know from other people, when they start using Salesforce, they get 20% more opportunities. And since you're already the number one performer, you could be the number 1.2 performer. <laughs> you know, you could be the best performer in the, probably your whole entire industry. I want to give you that help. So tell me what's holding you back. Yeah, I think that's, that's a great point. I think also too, there's like this old stereotype that we have of the top performer who doesn't want to, uh, you know, adopt new technology, but this is something that transcends generations. You know, we see a lot of times that very talented people can sometimes resist a change. So Shannon, excellent advice on how to kind of navigate that situation because it's not always easy. It can be a bit awkward. Um, so we do have another question coming from Christy. Um, thank you, Christy, for your question. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming. How do you keep upper management from negatively commiserating with staff about training on tech Huge topic. Upper management is also always brought up with training. So Shannon, what do you think? Christy, I will tell you the number of times that executive management is the one who says, this is too hard to use. I never log into it. I can't even remember my password. A lot of times executive management is a roadblock. You know, if you use a project management system where you have to identify blocker, so many times in terms of change management, it is executive management. And I like to treat them almost the same sort of way as I treat that number one performer, which is to say, and I'll go to the person who made the ultimate buying decision or the one who holds the budget in their P&L statement and say, why are you paying for Salesforce? You know, what, what drives you here? What's your motivation? Why'd you buy it? And if you weren't the one who saw the demo, why do you keep signing the checks, right? Because it's not cheap. So, so what's in that for you? And then you can start to understand what their motivating factors are and what their MO is. And that will tell you how to show them the WIFM for them. So um, one time I was working with a CFO who was like, I don't care about Salesforce. I want you to you know, take a screenshot of every single dashboard and send it to me in a PowerPoint presentation once a month. And I said, okay, all right, I can understand that. And I can see why you would be interested in seeing this information, but wouldn't you like to see it more than once a month? You know, are there other decisions that you make besides board report time? And he was like, you know, actually, yes, I would like to, because the first week of the month, we always do um, decisions on staff augmentation or staff reduction. And the second of the month, I rebalance everybody's budgets. Okay, I said, I'm gonna show you only one thing in Salesforce. I'm gonna show you how to log in and I'm gonna point you toward the dashboard that is going to cover all the things you need week one, week two, week three, week four of every month, every quarter, every year. And so when you can break that into that tiny little quick wins piece and you can do that for an executive, that's the way to sort of like get them to you know uh, open up a little bit because a lot of times, they're not entering opportunities every day and they too have fear, right? It's hard to find an executive job. That funnel is tight. So they don't want to lose their job because they looked silly, right? So there's, there's also a little bit of fear there that you can sort of unpack by saying, you know, what is it that is your biggest challenge? You know, what's your biggest pain point? And you can use those things to start to get underneath executives. And I have found the best time to do that is when you can see that they're still on chat and it's six o'clock at night or, you know, Saturday morning, you can see that little notification, you get an email from them, you know, they're there. Going out of your way says to them, here's somebody I can trust. And that's what you're trying to do is to, to, to develop that trust relationship with an executive. Yeah, the psychology of management is very, very interesting in which we see a lot of times that people are, you know, resistant only because they don't want to miss out. They don't want to seem like they're behind or, or dated, um, which can oftentimes lead to more issues than they definitely want to handle. So thank you so much. Great question. Like, love that. Um, does anybody else have any questions before we kind of move on to our next topic? I can see that we've got a couple. I can't see them since I'm sharing, but we've got some in the chat. Um, Those, I um, I just covered uh, Christie's and perfect. the ones from before, so I don't see any new ones. Uh, we just have some comments about the lone wolf salesperson, and you're welcome, guys. Thank you for You guys are also polite saying thank you after we answer questions. Uh, it's a great group we have here today. Awesome. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. So uh, if we don't have any more questions, we'll wait for another like 15 to 20 seconds if you guys want to type any last stuff in. But this has been a really great webinar. You guys have all been um, an excellent audience and asking great questions that um, are very pertinent to the information. So it's also very connected to our, our last um, webinar, which was about adoption. They're, they're very intertwined and that webinar is now posted on YouTube. So you guys can go back and rewatch and kind of connect the two now that you've had this one as well. 
Um, so what I'd like to do now is move on to a very quick introduction to what we're going to be calling Industry Week. So very excited to finally announce this. Me and Shannon have been working very hard. We're super excited to share with you that we are going to be hosting a full week of industry topic related Salesforce webinars. Um, so we're going to be kicking things off with uh, healthcare, moving on the next day to life sciences, the next day to financial services, and then finishing up with technology and professional services. So exciting. We're going to take each day to focus on different topics and give people the opportunity to talk about Salesforce and adoption and different sort of um, issues that they might have within their vertical, within their industry. It's super exciting. If you sell these verticals, join the webinar. If you are in these verticals, join the webinar because the information is going to be extremely pertinent to your day-to-day -day operations. Anything you'd like to share, Shan, before we get going? Oh, I'm crazy pumped about Industry Week because we are going to be doing um, something that I think everyone is going to be interested in, which is saying, here's a problem that we have seen commonly across these industries. Here's a solution for it. And then we're going to give live demos on how you can do that in Salesforce, how you can address that problem in Salesforce. So definitely sign up for Industry Week. I think you all will be really pleased by the amount of things we're going to share. It's going to be like a mega show and tell. <laughs> So please feel free to come along. If you had a question today about adult learner theory that we did not get to, or as soon as you hang up, you think of something, please reach out to Andrew and I. We are all over the place. We'd love to share the things on Twitter, LinkedIn. Um, you know, we, you can email us directly. We're happy to give back to the Ohana because we've gotten so much from it. And you know what, you guys, I have read this book for you. <laughs> So please let us know if there's something we can help you with. We're just immersed in this stuff and we love to be as helpful as we can. Absolutely. And I saw a couple questions in the chat about how they can get access to the learner's book because they're, you know, a little late to the show and that's perfectly fine. Like I will send everybody links to anything that they need. So please reach out to me. I have your names down for those of you who do need it. And then additionally, after this, I'll send out some information about our week of industry, our industry week learning and um, that way you guys can be up to date on that as well, which is super exciting. So, you know, thank you so much, everybody, for joining. I know that everyone has been like flooded and inundated with tons of webinar and lots of learning because people are trying to take advantage of being at home and having some, hopefully, some time for learning. But, you know, for taking the time during your lunchtime to really sit down and listen and um, hopefully learn is, is really exciting. And we're really happy to host all of you guys. So thank you so much. And please do reach out to us if you need anything. Great. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a marvelous day.